Chorsey Eisen for like that. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off, just a gentle reminder as always to our listeners and our viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Two brilliant interviews for you on the podcast this week which we're really excited to share with you all up first we're chatting to Cork and Skibbereen footballing legend Tony Davis about his great friendship with the one and only Small Mick who sadly passed away 23 years ago this week Tony spoke to Kieran about the brilliance of Small Mick both as a player and more importantly as a person we're also crossing the Atlantic for the first time to hear from Skibbereen soccer player and coach Liam Collins Liam has one of the most interesting sporting stories we've ever had on the podcast, including playing against the legendary Brazilian Ronaldinho. So you won't want to miss that one a little later on. So Kieran, two great chats this week, so we won't delay for too much longer. But just before we hear from Tony Davis, you've been in situ as the Star Sport editor for the best part of a decade now. And having spoken to hundreds of people, no doubt, who would have had some dealings with small Mick in their time. So what's your own sense of the man from what you've heard down through the years? Um, It comes true in this interview with Tony, but small Mick, by all accounts, was a pure character on and off the field. Um, Like I said, I've talked to many people over the last couple of years since I've been in West Cork uh, about about small Mick. um, Features with our Donovan Ross uh, tributes to small Mick over, over the years. And, he just comes across as this larger than life character that transcended the sport. You know, he's uh, very much a kind of the kind of Prince of Skibbereen. He was loved by the town and he loved the town itself. And his best days came in the Skibbereen jersey too. Um, obviously captain of the Skibbereen team that won the 1993 All-Ireland Senior Club Football Championship. And Odon and Rasa are still the only West Cork club to ever scale that height. And it was Mick McCarthy who captained that team. And that was probably his finest day in the replay, in the sorry, in the drawn All Ireland final against Aero Og of Carlo, he scored one eight of Skibs one twelve. And any match report you read from that game, they say he is the reason that Skibs survived that day and went on to the replay. And the rest is history. Um, he's a legend in, of O'Donnell and Rasa. He's a legend in in West Cork sporting circles, and that even transcended as well to the to the county team. He played for six seven seasons with the with the Cork seniors, won two All Irelands, captained the team in ninety three in the All-Ireland final against Derry. Um, just a magnificent man, first kind of off the field, but on the field, wherever you talk to said he was just magic. There was gold dust in, 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 his, in his football boots. He was a he was a match winner. He was the skibbering go-to man. He was their leader. He instilled a belief in that other than team that they could achieve everything, which they did. So um, it was great to chat to Tony Davis this week. For to reminisce, I think about Small Mick because, like you said earlier, he passed away 23 years ago this month. So it's a good time to look back and and remember just how how incredible a footballer Small Mick is because he will go down in the annals of Skibbereen's greatest ever footballer. You know, it, it's that simple. I've, I've talked to a couple of people about that um, because that club has produced some stalwarts like Tony Davis, like John Evans, Don Davis, some superb footballers over the years. Kevin O'Dwyer, the goalkeeper. But everyone comes back to Small Mick. He was just a, a legend in his own lifetime. So, like I said, it was great to chat to Tony Davis about one of Skibbereen and Cork's favourite football sons. Delighted to have the great Tony Davis on the podcast this week to so was look back and chat about one of Donovan Ross's greatest ever players, um, the, late, the late Mick McCarthy. Um, Tony, he was a man that you soldiered with for, for club and county for so many years, but when you hear his name, when you hear small Mick McCarthy, what springs to mind? Um, sadness, first of all, Kieran, because um, um, I suppose he just, he was gone too soon for everybody, um, his family, uh, I, the general community of Skibbereen as well, because Mick uh, encapsulated that whole spirit of what the O'Donovan Rossi Club and Skibbereen was all about. Um, 
a lot of us left Skibbereen when we were 18, either going working or going to college or stuff like that. Mick loved Skib. And he actually was a, he carried the jersey very lightly, Kieran, because when he played with Skibbereen, you were too young, but when I was small, there was a thing called the Incredible Hulk. And it's how a fellow metamorphosized from a man into a monster into something bigger than what they were. And when Mick put on that skip jersey, he'd arrive into the dressing room before the game and they'd be all joking and laughing and all, jeez, you know, how's the crack? And, you know, never took training that seriously, really, you know, until there was a game in the training. Um, but when he put on the jersey and the whistle blew, he metamorphosized into a different person completely. Um, that's spirit that will to win and in per- there are some players that you meet in in your life Karen that you know they're on they're full full on 24 7 you in fact a lot of the modern athletes is all about process and living the life and and that that couldn't be too far from small Mick right Mick love life love the crack love pulling strokes um, loved, you know, having a joke and a laugh and, you know, never minded being centre of the joke himself, but bloody hell, he'd get you back 10 times over, right? But then when the game started and it was a serious game where he had to deliver, he always delivered. He absolutely always delivered. Um, there was times, and I suppose when I think, no, the most famous one was the replay with Donald and Russa against Air Rogan Co. Park in the first time in the All Ireland final. We were shocking that day, really. It was, it was Mick actually um, single handedly um, pulled us out of that game. Uh, sheer force of will by him, really, that he refused to, um, to give in. I don't know what he scored that day, but it was. 1 just, 8. He scored 1 8 of your 1 8. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Like, Kieran, ordinarily, if you were to play a challenge game tomorrow and you were told to score 1-8, but you were playing in an all Ireland final against a team that was set up to stop him from playing, really. All right? So if you examine the opposition like everybody does and you say, Jesus, we have to stop Mick McCarthy from scoring. If we stop him from scoring, then more than likely we'll beat these guys. Right? And he scored 1-8. Like, that'll just tell you. Like, that was the winning of that all Ireland club for Skibbereen. That and his speech at halftime in, in Limerick. Um, they were the two times that I thought that, look, he, he just was a different person. With Cork then, he was a terrific corner forward, a really good corner forward, but... I think he, he, he just was a totally different person with Skibbereen. Whatever motivated him, whatever gave him that extra madness to carry a team, he actually had it with Skibbereen, if you understand what I mean. Because and that's not de- degrading him at all with Cork. But like I saw him putting performances in with Cork, you wouldn't believe. Like, we've played all our, God bless us all our life, we started school the same day. And um, I saw him play football that you couldn't believe, Kieran. You know, like, you watch Messi and you watch, like, Mick could... Mick could do anything with a ball, really, all right? And he'd have to be motivated up and he'd have to be in the time, if you know what I mean. Like, over in training, there might be days where he'd be just missing or having a crack, right? But um, when it was really down to... um, to deliver, he actually, he was very good. He was a top player, Kieran. Top player. And he could have played any sport, Kieran. You and know, he, he was really good. You know? You, you were sitting there, Tony, like he started school the same day. So you know better yeah. did, did anyone, the name Small Mick, that he's known by everyone around Skib and further beyond yeah. as Small Mick, how did that name come about? Yeah, I suppose, um, God, that was a long time ago now, Kieran. And um, in, our, in our class, there was about Rory, Skibreen was is a small town. Um, I suppose it was about 30 in the class, which would have been a big class around the time, right? And 
there was another Mick McCarthy in the class. He's still flying around Skibreen. I often see him around. And he was big Mick. And then there was small Mick. And out of that class that started that day, I suppose you'd have five or six Cork miners from that class alone, uh, Kieran. And I suppose if you go back to West Cork back in those days, we just played. You know, we just played for fun. We, we loved it. Um, we had Dermot O'Donovan, the local school teacher, who we all passed through when we were in sixth class. He was the headmaster in the school. But we had him all along. And, you know, we were doing that. And we were winning West Cork medals and stuff like that. Castlehaven were doing similar. Clan were good. Uh, Bantry were good. Bandon were good. Duman were good. So we were in our own kind of little bubble playing along. And sure, none of us ever thought that our only ambition was really to play with Skibreen. None of us ever thought to play with Cork. That was a kind of unheard of, really. There was one or two lads played Cork Minor back in the day, and they were kind of... You'd, you'd know who they were and you'd look up to them. But West Cork back then, there wasn't that many Cork miners. But the fact we played the likes of Clonakilty, Bantry, Castlehaven, Skip, or Dunman, Way, Bandon, and they were all pretty good. It brought us all on. So then we all went into secondary school, into St. Faulkner's. And we kind of realised then, just we're not too bad here because we played all our teams like Creasery and beat them and recognised teams. And then, geez, you know, we were kind of saying, maybe we're not too bad after all. You know, we, you know, you just don't know the barometer of success. We just we didn't have a clue. And then we went on. We won under. We won monsters and all this kind of stuff up along. And then we came to minor. And all of a sudden, at 15, 16 years old, you had a gang of us playing minor with Cork. You know, and Mick was central to all this. Um, you had a you had a group of about fifteen or sixteen lads in West Cork at the time that could have played Cork Minor, I, and I mean the standard of Cork Minor back then, like Kieran, standards are everything, and our ambition was to win an honour in every year, and we probably had the capabilities to do that if things went right. And Mick was sinful to all that. He was sinful to all that. He was one of the go-to players from under 12 right up. You know, um, like, I, even in my mind's eye now, if I had a ball in my hand, I could actually know where, what he's going to do, right? I, could, I can visualize in my head, I just get the ball, I take two steps and bang right out the wing on the outside of my foot and I know he's gone. He's gone. And neither God nor man would stop that for that steps, all right? He was the fastest guy over four or five yards. You couldn't believe it. Everybody knew he was going to do it, all right? Nobody could stop him. He also had a kind of a sidestep with his ball, with his hand that he'd go around. Everybody knew he was going to do it, but you couldn't stop him. You know, you meet these players in life. Colin Corkery was another guy who over five yards. Like, everyone was saying Colin was slow. Colin was the fastest guy over five yards I ever marked. Couldn't touch him. You could not touch him. There's no point in telling Colin run 100 yards. You're wasting your time. Mick, Mick could make that run. And if he didn't get the ball... The hand will go up in the air, and you're going to be bloody sure he's not going to make the second run out to the thing, right? But nine out of ten times when he made that run, he had the ball. And if he had the ball in his hand, it's either a score or a free. 100%. You know, he's, I'd love to somebody to go back over his games with a stats thing now, Kieran, and just uh, get his percentages. They're frightening, frightening. You know? I was I was chatting to Gino Driscoll before, like Gene obviously part of that greater than yeah. the team, and he was saying the game plan was so simple, get the ball to Small Mick as fast and as often as possible. And in that ninety two, ninety three season that saw Skib go from thirty three to one outsiders at the start of the county championship to becoming all Ireland champions kind of how many ever months later, like he was so central to that team, Tony. He was, was yeah. 
he was, but I suppose, clearly you have to look at the overall picture of the, the players that were on that team. At the, I think Cork were beaten early in the championship that year. I can't remember now. But then you had about six or seven Cork senior players that were either playing or fringes on the team together, if you, if you know what I mean, concentrating on, on this. And you need to look too, here. It was several times during that year, right, I, uh, that, you know, that we could have been beaten, you know. But I think sometimes your name is on it and, you know, that's, you know, you're meant to do something. And that was meant to happen that year. Like even the replay uh, against their rogue above in, um, in Limerick, there was a ball that came into the square, they got a goal and it was disallowed. Not too sure, you know. You get away with these things. Um, but I suppose, look, that's they're the look you need, right? But Mick was central to the whole thing. Um, Mick was in Skibreen. He loved it. He was central to absolutely everything we did that year. And was happier in Skibreen. He was happiest in Skibreen here, actually, if you know what I mean. Like, you know. Um, but the crack he had as well and the friends he had around the place, you know. Um, like, he loved the dogs, loved the horses, loved pulling strokes and having the crack, you know. Um, I, I can't tell you half the stories, Kieran, because a lot of these people are still alive and um, I probably end up in court or insulting somebody by telling you, but no badness or malice in it, but absolute pure crack, you know what I mean? Like, you got to mention, Tony, about that, that, that Skibreen team, like, there's obviously yourself, there was John Evans, Ian Breen, Gene, Don, John Brady, Kevin Dwyer, Neville Murphy, Jesus, there were so many talented players on that team and obviously Small Mick was there as well and yeah. I suppose what you're best to remember for is you're the only West Cork team, the only West Cork club ever to win the All-Ireland Senior um, Club title and you mentioned it there about the, the draw and replay against Aero Oak of, of Carlo when Small Mick got 1-8. Is it fair to say that was his greatest performance in a Skibbereen jersey? Oh, without doubt. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, there's no doubt. No, Kieran. If I could go through from under 12 to senior, I guarantee you there's another 15 or 20 performances like that. But it's the most significant because it's, it, it actually, uh, by winning a club All-Ireland, I suppose, look, it, it, sets, it sets it apart a little bit, okay, in that, look, it's, um, it's special. It's special for that group of players and it's special for Skibbereen. And... Look, it was Mick really that day above in Co Park that uh, that did it. I remember another time, you'll have to check out the score, Kieran, because I don't know what the score was, right? But dur- during our transition, we were winning quite a bit. Uh, so we won an honour in a minor in 81. Now, Mick wasn't on it because Mick actually is a year. I November, I don't know what Mick was. I see February or March of 65. I was November 64. But anyway... We won an honor in a minor in 81. So what they did then is they integrated us into um, the Cork Junior team. They just felt that to be good progression for us to, to go, um, you know, to go on to senior. And who was training? John Finton Daly was training the team, actually. She was a savage team, Kieran. Um, on that team, you had um, Dennis Walsh, the goalie. Right, Dennis Walsh, the full back, he was from Middleton, a hurler. You had Connor Coonan, you had Teddy Mack, you had Danny Cullity, you had Mick, um, Kieran Roy, savage team. So, it was anyone that wasn't actually playing senior with their club could play junior. We were playing with Carberry at the time, uh, senior that was 1984, that's the first game senior. But we went over to uh, to Coventry to play. Lancashire, I think, was in an All Ireland junior final. And there was a crowd, there was a gang from Skibreen, the McLeans, they had their hotels and pubs and everything over. So they met us off the plane and they wined us and dined us for the night. This is the night before the game, Kerr, right? So it was a very late night, Kerr, to be quite honest with you. So I remember waking up in the morning with Mick and um, uh, the game was on at whatever time it was. We had to go down and have breakfast and go to the game anyway. But Mick, there might have been a nefarious intent by the McLeans to put us off a small bit, right? But I think Mick, 
I think he got three goals that day. I felt sorry for the lad marking him, actually, because I'd say the boys told him that, ah, should we were out half the night the night before, you know, and that he, he wouldn't be able to run, all right? Again, you'll have to check up what he scored that day. I think it was some sort of a record, actually, because I felt sorry for the lad marking him because he couldn't even see him. He was flying around the place. I think he got three-something that day, Kerr. It was just frightening what he scored, you know. But, you know, Mick enjoyed life. He always delivered that year. Always delivered. Great crack, great fun, uh, great sense of devilment, and you know, you you would know what he'd get up to, you know. So you, you kind of talked there, Tony, about his scoring exploits, and I found the nineteen ninety two Kelleher Shield final against Bishop Town was played in in nineteen ninety three October ninety three, and skipper seven points down early yeah. in the second half, and legend has it that someone was saying to me, "Jesus, make the game started forty minutes ago. Are you going to try anything?" And then within fifteen minutes, he scored four goals. And yeah. they said it, it just summed him up. Skib scored 4 5 that day to win the Killer Shield final, and Small Mick scored 4 4. It's an incredible yeah. telly. But that's the type of person he was. And you know what? He lived, if he worked to put a heat map on the pitch, right, where there, the D is now, I'd say he never moved outside the D. Never. Just a little bit, maybe, to get an initial possession. But a little bit, out, I'd say that was his area. And you said it earlier on, Kieran, right? No Hopper solo, no Messi. Get the ball and deliver it as quickly and accurately to him. And if he gets in his hand, that's it. Everybody else often, Kieran, then is a support structure in so far as if he, can't, if he can't do anything with it, then he'll give it to someone else, all right? But, it, but in real terms, somebody fouled him or... You know, and his record from freeze was unbelievable. You know, it really was. Um, top, top player, top player in all levels, in all levels, you know. And, like, it's hard. Like, at, at top-level sport, Kieran, and particularly in Gaelic football and hurling nowadays, you get one year free. So you come on the scene and you do really well, right? So from then on, you're a marked man. It's from then on you're judged. So Mick was always marked and doubly marked and trebly marked when, when Skibreen were playing because they knew well if you could mark him, you'd probably beat him, all right? And yet he still got all those scores, you know? So that's probably the essence of him. Um, so there was always fellas hanging out with him, you know? That's just the way it is, you know? You said, Ed, like, he, his greatest moments in the Skibreen jersey – but his, his court career wasn't half bad either. He got, they came off the bench in the 89 final, got a couple of fights against Mayo, started very well against Mead, I think, in 1990 before he went off injured. So there's still big moments from him in a, in a court jersey too over the years. Ah, sure, look, he could have done it on any stage, Kieran. All he needed was possession. And he had an unerring sense of where the goal was. You know, his return from possession was frightening. And you can... I can still see him getting those balls. I can see him doing the sidestep. I could, you could read it a mile off. And again, all you had to do was get the ball to him. You know, I can remember him in 89 when we beat Mayo on the all Iron final. The relief, because that's what it was. After all the years trying, it was relief rather than any other feeling. And I remember uh, coming off the field with Mick that day and we were saying Jesus thanks for the Jesus we won that anyway you know which was more relief than anything here do you know what I mean so football was a big part of his life but a, quite a large part of his life was outside the game it was put being like the coursing or the dogs or horses or or stuff like that you should talk to John Terry a bit about that John would know a little bit about more about that than I would care right but uh, they John and himself were great friends, and um, Asher, they, uh, they, you know, they got up to some crack the two of them, you know, back down the years. Yeah, it seems like he was an absolutely incredible footballer, but an incredible man too. Can you hear that, by the way? Even though people are speaking so kindly and fondly of, of Small Mick, so thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for coming on to join us to talk about Small Mick. But just to check in with you now, how is how is life treating you right now? I'm not so bad, Karen. Like everybody else, I'm not going too far. Um, Small bit of training, that's it, basically, um, like everybody is, L looking forward to the summer, but um, like today's Monday, so we had rugby and soccer for the weekend, that kind of kept me going, um, I love all sports, absolutely everybody, every sport, 
that's there. So thanks be to God for that. Other than that, you go off your game, Kieran. To be honest with you, you know. So just hang in there. I suppose the summer is coming, and I see football now. Our uh, the GA has put off now till when is it? April. We're saying that, yeah. April. So hopefully it will start up in April again. I thought they got it wrong. Actually, I thought they should have started the club competition first, and. Um, the latter part of the year then hopefully maybe people can go to games and you know so they're not going to do that as far as I know they're going to start with the inter-county and um, we'll see where we go from there but I suppose it's something to look forward to here you know it's not a great time of the year the January is a disaster with the weather and stuff but sure we have something to look forward to here because you were involved with Ordinal Rossa last year, yeah. Tony, and you saw how well that, that club window worked and then the Intercounty was yeah. played after and club players, every player absolutely loved that defined club window and then the Intercounty, like I said there, was, was played after the club. Should, should he even look now again at maybe doing something like that again? Because it worked so well last year and the way the GA season could pan out, maybe it's ready to get club players out there first and get them playing again. Well, I think... I think I think it, that's what should have been done. It should have been done earlier. I'm not sure with the restrictions that are in place now with the 5K that it, 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 it can be done now. Um, if the restrictions weren't in place, then I think they should look at uh, running the club off first. There's a, there's a very small amount of people playing to county football hurling, boys and girls. The majority of the Jays club, and that should always be first. So that should always be the, 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 the most important part of the J. I think that's actually happening. I think there is, there's a change in mindset now. And it's swinging back in favour of the club as far as I can see. And it would be easier to play the club championship this time uh, from once the restriction eases. Um, get everybody back up to playing to a level. Um, the club championship finishes or take it to a, a stage where you're in the semi-finals or something like that. So everybody has a meaningful uh, season. And then go and play your inter-county. It means then the county players then as well are, are up to speed. They're not picking up injuries. You know, they're, they're in good form. And it would be later in the year where hopefully crowds could go to again. I'm hoping September, October next year um, that crowds will hopefully at that stage with all the vaccines and hopefully all the, 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 the infection rate will be down, that we'll be able to go to games and it will mean if you quit for the J as well, which is vital, you know. Okay. You saw last year, Karen, they were very strict. Mm-hmm. Very strict. In fact, for all the games last year, I didn't go inside the world at all for any of the games because there was only a few selectors allowed inside. I was ha- well, I, I'm happy enough up in the hill anyway because you have a better view of, of, of the game, you know, than on the level. But... And um, they were very, very strict at the gates. And that's all over the county. Very strict. And rightly so. Hopefully in the next couple of months that we get to the situation where the club players will get back out playing to it because they've been, Jesus, they haven't played down with what, six, seven months and it's, it's a long time. And there's, there's obviously like every inter-county player is a club player in a way. So I, I, well, first, yeah. I think it makes sense. Get the club players out there first, get them playing again and run the inter-county off after. But I think we have to wait and see what the powers that be think about yeah. that. But um, Tony, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're very welcome, Kieran. For... And the best of luck. Take care, Tony. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Now, Kieran, for the first time ever in Star Sport Podcast history, we're going to cross the Atlantic to, United, to the United States to talk to a Skibbereen soccer player who undoubtedly has one of the most interesting sporting backstories that we've ever covered on this podcast. This is a man who left Skibbereen, left Cork, left Ireland and went to follow his footballing slash soccer dreams in the United States and it eventually led to him sharing the field with the one and only Ronaldinho. So before we hear from Liam Collins, what can you tell us about him? That was an incredible story that we carried in, in last week's Southern Star. That Joe McCarthy got in touch with Liam just for supposed to check up how things are going in the States. And Liam regaled him of the time that he captained the international team against a team of ex Brazilian players that was led by Ronaldinho, which is incredible to think uh, a young fella who left these shores back in 2010, a young skill ring lad, was captaining a team against a 
one of the greats of the game, like an absolute legend, Ronaldinho, is, um, is a great story. So as soon as I saw that piece by Joe, I was straight on to, to, to Liam. I said, you have to come on the podcast. I said, I want to hear the story. I want to, I want to hear your story about when you left Skibreen to go to America and you're still there, what, 11 years later. Um, football has been so good to him. Um, it gave him the opportunity to go to the States on a scholarship. He's now teaching over there. He met his wife through, through football as well. He was telling me um, his life is over there now. He's he's coaching, he's teaching, he's still playing away at the weekend. So an incredible story if you think that uh, that his, his Green men went up against Ronaldinho. And there's clips to prove it too. I, I sourced a couple of clips on, on, on YouTube and Twitter. So an um, incredible story, like I said. And um, there's nobody to listen to me anymore. I think it's time to talk to the main man, Liam Collins, as he regales us if he's adventures in the States so far. For the first time now, the Star Sport podcast has gone across the Atlantic and all the way over to America, and in particular to to a, a town 25 minutes outside St. Louis to chat to Skibbereen's own Liam Collins. Welcome to the podcast, Liam. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. Uh, we did an interview with Liam in last week's Southern Star when Joe McCarthy caught up with Liam, and what grabbed my attention from that piece was, um, was the start of Joe's George's interview with you when he spoke about the time you played against Ronaldinho and straight away in my head, it was like, wow, here's a Skibbereen man who went to America back in 2010 and he captained the team against Ronaldinho. So before we chat soccer in America and life, life over the States and your journey and adventure in America, take me back to 2017. So that exhibition game, you were, you were captain of Inter Nashville and you were taking on a team of ex-Brazilians who were captained by Ronaldinho, who we all know is a world superstar, one of the great Brazilian footballers of of our time, of, of all time. So how did that all come about, Liam? Um, well, I'm not sure how the actual game came about, but the owner of the club that I played for had some connection somehow to Ronaldinho. I don't know, was it his, through his brother or through an agent or something? And they figured out, I guess, the, the pay package for him and they paid him quite a bit of money to come in for the weekend and play an exhibition game. And he brought, I think there was about five ex-pros with him and then five just friends, I guess, um, and just played an exhibition game. They saw tickets for it, tried to, to kind of make it a big event. He was in town. It was in Nashville, so he got to see the Titans, met the Tennessee Titans, the NFL team and stuff like that. So they kind of sold him this um I guess, obviously, a bit of money to make, but a good weekend to see the NFL to, to do things like that in Nashville. Um, and obviously, the highlight then for us was having that exhibition game. Uh, it was, like you said, kind of surreal, uh, walking out next to to someone who's a Ballon d'Or winner or someone when I was growing up was probably the best player that there was because this was before Ronaldo and, and Messi. Um, so it was super surreal. So just a connection between the owner at the club and someone that knew Ronaldinho, and that's kind of how it came about. And then when they agreed on, I guess, a fee for him to come into town, that's when it was kind of finalised. The beauty of the internet means that there's clips of this out there. And I was watching a clip of you walking out as captain of International, and right beside you was Ronaldinho. Like even for that alone, like that's like we've mentioned the word surreal already. But to walk out alongside Ronaldinho. Both, both of you as captains for an exhibition game like that's something that's that, it's magic like that's a tell your grandkids moment kind of years down the line it, it was very very cool we spoke a few words he had very kind of broken English but um, got to speak a little bit with him got to you know shake his hands at the the coin toss at the start of the game and exchange kind of pleasantries that way so it was yeah, one of those things that kind of probably flew by at the time. And then when you look back at it, it's like, Jesus was actually Ronaldinho that was on the field next to me and not just some other kind of normal opponent that you're playing with. So it was it was a very cool experience. How was it like in the game itself? Did you see those, those famous Samba skills? Uh, he kind of trotted around a little bit, but there was one part of the game, all right, where he just turned up the gears a little bit and just went past three or four fellas like they weren't even there. Um, so once, I guess, once in the game, uh, you could just see he got a kind of deeper in midfield and just turned and just went up through the gears quickly. And he he was out of shape and not anywhere near uh, the fitness he would have been back when he was at the top, but he still was able to just go past players like they weren't even there in that one instance. 
And there was a couple of more kind of well-known Brazilian players too. I think um, Cleberson, former Man United player, was there and Marcelo, ex-Real Madrid. So like that was a star-packed um, Brazilian team that came to town that day. Yeah, it was Cleberson. Got to talk to him for a little bit. And Emerson, that was, uh, I think it was AC Milan and Real Madrid as well. He played. Um, Cleberson was still very, very fit because I think he was just maybe finished playing in America or still maybe playing somewhere in America. Um so he was still fit and able to get around. Emerson was a little older, but... Uh, and there was two other fellas. One that I think played for Fiorentina. I, I don't know. I don't remember his name. But they had about five players that had, had been at top clubs in Europe. And we just said there, like, you, you shared the pitch with Ronaldinho, Clevers and Marcelo. Let's go back to earlier days when you shared the pitch with the likes of Don Lock, Hodnett, Rob McCarthy, um, Ryan Price, the, these fellas... Um, Take me back to those under 12, under 14, under 16 days of Skibbereen, because I was talking to Ryan Price last year and he was telling me that Skib team cleaned up all before them. Yeah, we had a very good team starting off kind of under 12 in the West Cork League. Um, who did we have up front? David Shannon and Alan Holland just couldn't stop scoring. And then uh, Ryan in goal and Rob McCarthy, Richard Hodden at Don Logue. Um, who else was in that team? Lad, it was very, very strong team. Yeah, we we did really. It was seemed to be always at those times ourselves and Riverside were the, the big kind of um, derby games, I guess. And who would have been Gary Toomey at Riverside? He was a very good soccer player um, in those days, under 12s and 13s and 14s. He would have been probably the best player in West Cork, easy, if not the best player in Cork at, at those age groups. So it was always seemed to be ourselves kind of going against Riverside. Like some great memories from then. And that was kind of the, the start of your soccer career. And it eventually took you across to the States under scholarship. But go back again to those younger days, Liam. Was soccer always your first love? Um, I'd say it was, yeah. I played Gaelic football and I played hurling as well. Um, I was all right at them. One, uh, we won a county at minor with um, O'Donovan Rasa, and I, that was probably my last real competitive Gaelic football was playing that minor team that we won the, the county. Um, I played a little bit maybe of junior and maybe under-21 stuff after that, but kind of hit inconsistent. I think that minor team was the last time I really played competitive GA hurling, probably maybe under-16 or something like that. But um, soccer, well, yeah, for me, was always kind of number one growing up, yeah. And then obviously Cork City came calling and you were a couple of great years with Cork City. Um, what are the standout memories for, for you from that time? Um, well, we won the, the Youth Cup, which is the, the biggest one for, for my time when I was there. We won the under-18 Youth Cup um, in Turner's Cross as well against uh, was it Salt Hill Devon, I think it was that time. So that would have been the highlight. But all of them were good. I got to play... A few first team games under Roddy Collins right before the club went uh, bankrupt or right before the club folded. I think that was January 2010. I played five or six preseason games under Roddy Collins. So that was nice to kind of be involved with the first team. Obviously, it went bankrupt right around that time or folded and it changed into Forest in a few months after. But um, the Youth Cup would definitely be the, the highlight of that time. And it was around in Thule, wasn't it? You got the offer of the scholarship to go to go across to the States. I think that was to the University of, of Memphis, if, if I'm right. Um, how, how, would, how, well, how big a decision was that first for you? Like you were still, still so young to decide to leave home, to leave West Cork, leave Skib and your family and friends to pursue your, your dream and your goal in, in the States. Yeah, and it was, I guess at the time, wasn't something if you asked oh, would you be there in five years or ten years? It wasn't any of that. I was looking more immediate. And if I liked it, I'd stay on. And if I hated it, I could come home at Christmas time kind of thing. It was one of those things that um, it came about right. It was yeah, probably January to March, maybe 2010, around that time frame it came about. Because I, there, I remember there was issues with trying to sign back with Cork City or taking the scholarship offer and the, I was actually in Stephanie at the time and with Liam Murphy and uh, Paddy Gleeson who were in, in charge of the kind of soccer side of Stephanie and they were fairly straightforward with me saying that there, there'd be more opportunities playing League of Ireland if it didn't work out and stuff like that so take this and my parents as well kind of saying look just take this opportunity and if you don't like it you can always come home kind of thing so 
Um, it was one of those kind of things, maybe taking just a jump at it to try it. And, and if it worked out, great. If it didn't work out, well, at least I kind of tried it. And um, But having done it, I, I'd do it all again anyway. It's something that, um, yeah, I'd advise any person, unless you're, you know, cracking into making academies or making it in England, or you're definitely getting into the League of Ireland. If you're right on those fringes, I would say to any... Any young fella that's on the kind of fringes, maybe not sure if they're going to get in to just take a look at it. And if you don't like it, you can come home at Christmas time and then you can start in the League of Ireland the following year. Or, um, But no, it's something that I'm yeah, delighted that I took the step into doing that time. And it kick-started an incredible adventure that's still ongoing right now. And when you when you moved over to the University of Memphis first, what was the, kind of, the big change for you? What was so different at home? Did anything kind of stand out apart from the... American accent and just the, the different culture. What was the big change for you? Uh, not being able to walk everywhere was a massive change. Um, you know, when you come from a small town like Skib, you can walk to training, you can walk to town, you can do all that stuff. But even for us, we like trained a couple of miles from where I lived and but played was like 12 miles from where we lived and stuff like that. So there was trying to find a car and being broke that first year and trying to find someone to give you lift the trainings and all that kind of stuff was definitely a shock. And then the culture and going from Skib to a city like Memphis that's got, I don't know, probably a million people in it um, was a, a big shift. And then kind of getting used to how big university sports are in the US. It's a, it is basically kind of a professional level, but not obviously being paid, but how much money goes into it, how much TV stuff goes into it. Um, just being a part, I guess, of a university team and not realising how big it is uh, definitely took kind of a bit of time to get used to, you know, seeing your games on the television and seeing your games in different places like that. Just playing college seemed like kind of out of this world at that time. So that took took a little bit of time to get used to. In fairness, you Dave, you kind of hit the ground running. I was looking at a couple of stats there. I think you you led led in assists every year for four years at the University of Memphis. You got on the All ACC Conference winner, and in in your sophomore year, your junior year, and and your senior year as well. So it's fair to say that you took your your skill and talent from Skibbereen and West Cork. It transcended the the Atlantic, and you were able to show how good you are across the water as well. So standard wise, you kind of you fit it in straight away as well. Yeah, and it was, um, yeah, it, it, the physicality of it took, I'm a smaller fella, and it, the physicality took a little bit of getting used to at first. But once I kind of figured out that you'd play a little bit quicker and uh, things like that, it, it didn't take too long to, to settle in. Um, the physicality would have been the biggest difference. Big, strong, athletic players that you're coming against kind of was the biggest, um, I guess, adjusting factor that, I had to try and get used to but once you kind of overcome that aspect of the game it was pretty it was okay the standard was good I the uh, college the division one college level that I played at it's a good very good standard I'd say you know UCD UCC teams like that at home would compete but um, it's a it's a good level yeah it's a it's a good standard talk me through so the kind of the steps in because you went to to Nashville FC and, and you, you went up along the kind of rooms as well so from your college days and we'll chat to soccer now um, the different steps to, that you took because you, you got to a fairly high level over you got to was it the third tier down from from the top level over in, in America so talk me through that Liam um, yeah and it would have stemmed from from playing in college and, and doing well in college and kind of getting your name out that way and teams looking uh, for players out of college, so I played. I played all over the place. I played in Toronto for a couple of seasons in Canada. I played at DC United uh, for a summer, um, and it was just kind of off of college seasons. You know, people seeing you on uh, different games that are on television, and people getting in touch with your coaches and stuff like that, trying to figure out what what you were doing after school and what you were doing, um, kind of moving forward. So it would came off college mostly. If you do well in college and get enough kind of exposure, then teams seem to start kind of uh, knocking on your door a little bit, I guess. But yeah, it would have been off the, the college scene, really, is where people would have seen you first. 
because you had a very good time with Inter Nashville, like and that was in the semi pro league, I think. Um, like I was saying there, it's kind of the, the third tier in the in the US soccer pyramid. And 2017 kind of stands out, I think, as a season. It was very memorable for, for you, Liam. You won the South Eastern Conference and you got to the national quarter final as well. And you were telling me before that you were unlucky to go further. Kind of obviously great memories from that season you must have. Because you also because you because uh, you, you were all sorry you were named on the 2017 NPSL team of the year too. So when you consider that there was a hundred teams in that league, I think that's an uh, an incredible achievement for you on a personal level. Yeah, and that team was it was just one of those teams that seemed to click. If you asked us before the season, we'd have probably told you we wouldn't have won five games, <laughs> and then we just started kind of it just started rolling. We started winning games and upsetting teams. Um, and it just went really well. All we played on a personal level really suited me. We wanted to try and get it down and try and play through teams, um, which can be sometimes a little different than what a lot of teams try and do at that level, where it's just get it forward as quick as you can and kind of build off of that. But really suited me. And like I said, we just kind of started on this role of winning games. Sometimes we wouldn't be playing the best and we'd pull out a win, or sometimes we'd shock teams early on and we'd be up two or three after 20 minutes um, but it it was just one of those things everyone seemed to click that summer uh, the team chemistry was great and the, the wins just started to keep on coming um, and like you said I, we probably could have gotten a little bit further but um, we won the conference which was the first time that club had done it um, and then got as far as the quarterfinals so that was uh, just a super experience and Winning that conference down in New Orleans against New Orleans um, in the final as well was a good experience. And having a, a night or two out in New Orleans then after winning it was a, a great experience. I was going to say, New Orleans strikes me as very much a party town, so probably good memories from that weekend as oh. well. <laughs> yeah, it took about a week to get over, I think, after winning that conference down there that time. <laughs> like You were still, what, then, probably mid-20s and still like kind of the best was yet to come out of you because um, thinking so MSL was that ever in your thoughts then okay I'm doing quite well here let's just take this on a bit further because you had trials with St. Louis back in, in 2016 that didn't work out but was it ever in your head did Liam to say let's see how far I can get to the top level over here in America yeah I would I spent like I said I spent the summer at DC United and I trained a few times with the first team and um, just played with the reserves and it never really went any further than that and then I was looking to move up to St. Louis uh, so trialed for about two weeks with the team in St. Louis um, and I think if I actually hadn't been an international that would have worked out um, but at the time I wasn't a permanent resident I needed a visa and then the leagues then um, I don't know if it's still the same but then it was you could only have eight international spots on a on a squad so um just didn't want to use one of those on someone who hadn't been in the league, who hadn't been, didn't have that experience of playing in that league, which was fine. I completely understand that. So that never worked out. So after the St. Louis one, then I just kind of knocked around the, the semi-pro. I didn't really look to to push on after that. I tried kind of finding a career, I guess, uh, and something that I could do for for the rest, of, the rest of my life and the rest of my working life rather than kind of, chase around I'm sure if I went on trial different places I, I could have got in somewhere but I was looking to try and settle in St. Louis so once once that team didn't work out then um, I just kind of started looking at careers that would allow me to play um, during the summer as well with semi-pro stuff and things like that so yeah that's kind of the the route I took after that you found a career in teaching, didn't Liam? And was it around then, I suppose, as well, that you were thinking America might become your home for the foreseeable future? Kind of like, had you ever the option to come back home to West Cork, or were you just so happy with life in America? You said, "I'm going to just kind of just stay here and just see what happens." Um, yeah, it was kind of a bit of both. When I was just finishing up at Memphis, I had a few. I was in contact a little bit with John Caulfield about coming back, uh, very briefly, just over emails and stuff like that, and getting international clearance ahead of coming back and things like that but that never really got too serious it was only a few emails kind of back and forth so not a, nothing too serious so then I just I had at the time finishing school a serious girlfriend here who's now my wife so I had that aspect too um, of it so I was really enjoying myself here and never really seriously looked into coming coming back home too much 
So it's the teaching kind of career and teaching path that, that you followed. So was it? Yep. Yep. Uh, 2017, I was in um, college coaching while I was in Nashville playing with international. So I had done the three years of college coaching, which allowed you as well then to play kind of semi-pro. You could train in the evenings, you could travel for the games and stuff. So I was doing that from 2014 to 2017. And then I was looking just to try and move up to St. Louis. So I trialed with the, the St. Louis team, which would have been in the, the tier just below the MLS. And that, that didn't work out. So then I was just looking for career jobs, I guess. And luckily being through college and having my degrees and stuff, teaching was an option. So I, I eventually kind of found my way into teaching. And you mentioned coaching as well. I was very interested in, in your coaching career because you were in, was it the Missouri Military Ca- Academy for a couple of years as a head varsity soccer coach there? And now you're in, is it um, Francis Howell North in, in St. Charles, Missouri as a as a teacher and you coached kind of the high school um, girls and boys teams there as well. So is coaching a passion of yours as well, Liam? Yeah, I, I you know, it's as close as I can get to really... to. To playing and if you can kind of pass anything on that you might know or um, help anyone out whether it's maybe trying to get kids over here into college teams and, and things like that then it's it's nice to see and it, it just it gets me around the game I can train you know a few times a week with them still and you know watch the games then and stuff like that so um, it helps in the classroom too if you go watch your um, the students are teaching the classroom you watch their games at night and that gives you something kind of in common with those as well so it gives you a few less headaches in the classroom as well and tell me a bit about your time with Missouri Military Academy I'd say that was probably surreal again to kind of be to kind of coaching in a, and teaching in, in, a, in a, a school like that yeah that was uh, a culture shock for sure yeah I was just looking for teaching jobs in the area and just that was the one that suited the degree I had and the, there was a soccer position available there. So I just jumped at it when I um, had the opportunity and it's a, a surreal environment. All right, kids are wearing basically military uniforms going to school and it's very kind of regimented what they do. What I, I don't, I didn't have any kind of involvement with the, the military aspect. I just was in the classroom and then on the, the pitch after school for trainings but there's kind of a, a military aspect to the school too that makes sure they're I guess marching correctly and all of that kind of stuff so seeing that definitely took some getting used to seeing as I don't have any experience with any of that besides being at that school. I'd say that's a, an entirely different world to when you're in school yourself back home in Skip was it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, some of us probably need it. <laughs> uh, and, and then, like I said, now you're well, in, in, in Francis Howell North in, in St. Charles, Missouri. Um, how is life there now? They said you're, you're teaching and you're coaching. Um, kind of, what's, what's life like in the States right now? We're obviously kind of post-election, so the Joe Biden era has, has started over there. Kind of, is it a, what's that been like the first month or so, of Joe Biden? Um, it's uh, like I was saying to Joe when I was talking to him on a personal level for me, it, it hasn't really had any impact yet. I guess the only thing you don't really see is the maybe crazy headlines that you would have seen in the previous uh, administration. So, so far, I guess it's been uh, quieter in terms of headlines, but on a, on a personal level yet, anyway, it hasn't made too much impact um, on me at my level. So all good so far with, with Biden. And even I suppose kind of it, it's the it's the global story the last eleven months or so. But the, the pandemic in America, we've we've seen the headlines over here, and you've probably seen the headlines in America what life is like in Ireland right now. But how is life life for you are right now, kind of in terms of movement and so on? Are you, are you restricted much? Is it like is it like back home in West Cork, or is it a lot more? Have you more freedom to move around? Um, it's definitely more lenient over here. Um looking at at home it's much more kind of mandatory lockdowns and much it seems much stricter whereas here um there was a lot of pushback to kind of mandatory masks and mandatory rules basically so a lot of the stuff is more advised or recommended that you do this and you do that there's not really going to be any fines or anything like that but restaurants and bars and stuff they're open for the most part, you just have to try and social distance. You have to wear your mask going into most places, but there's no, I guess, top down enforcement of of any of it. Really, um, it is definitely more um, 
kind of you should do this because it's good for everyone rather than you have to do this kind of um so then that leads to you know lots of people not doing it and people doing their own thing so it's the a more lenient approach whether that's right or wrong i guess um i don't know if we'll i guess we'll see how the next few months pans out with him rolling out the vaccines and, and things like that so hopefully they can kind of get a handle of it soon and like I mentioned there, you're, you're teaching and, and, and coaching still. Are you still playing, Dion? Uh Yeah, I, I'm i playing no more just um, for enjoyment, even though other, I might look at playing again this summer, but I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll have to see how the, the fitness is. Um, but I play in, a, in an indoor league a couple of nights during the week, and then on Sundays, there's a Sunday league that I play in um, as well, but that's more just kind of, Meds for for fun at this stage, but um, that's been stalled now for the winter period. That actually stops over here from about November to March, just because of how cold it gets. Um, so right now I'm just playing indoor a couple of nights of the week um, at the moment. But Sunday league, then hopefully back up in March again, and then potentially the summer. But I'm not not too de- too decided yet if I'm playing. It's like you, you obviously have your feet firmly rooted in, in, in America right now. So I presume that dashes any hopes of Skibbereen kind of getting you back in to help the promotion, pop up, the promotion push up to the Premier Division. No, I don't. I don't think my wife would, uh, <laughs> would like me trying to, to move back to get Skib back to the, the Premiership. But uh, hopefully they can. Yeah, this season coming or as soon as soon as possible because they the club at that size and at the facilities and stuff like that should should be playing in the in the highest level in West Cork. And I presume over the years too there's been no shortage of skibbereen lads or fellas from home kind of inviting themselves over to America to spend a bit of time with you and, and soak up the American culture. Yeah, I've had a few, yep. Yeah. I've had a few uh, a lot of them came over. It was great for my wedding in summer twenty nineteen there was I don't know fifteen or sixteen of the lads that some of the lads we'd already talked about and and other lads that I'm good friends with. So that was uh a great experience having them over for two weeks and my brother actually works over here Mark now he's been working here for the last year and a half now um, so he's at the military academy currently uh, he's a business teacher and he coaches the soccer team there now uh, that I'm gone um, so he's only an hour down the road so he calls up a lot of weekends when um, you know if he's got nothing else going on he'll call up to our place here and um so he's there, and yeah, there's been a few over the years. Um, it is, and it is definitely nice seeing seeing people from home, especially with the the pandemic. No, I was initially supposed to go home last summer, and that got cancelled. And I had rescheduled to this summer, and that probably won't happen again either. So it'll be since 2018, I think was the last time I was back in in Skib. So it's yeah, it's it's been a while now. Right. And when, I suppose when the leagues do get back running here, and even before when the leagues were up and running, would you always keep an eye out for how Skib are doing in the West Cork League and how O'Donovan and Ross are, are doing in the football championship? Oh, yeah, always. I talked to, you know, all the, all the lads that we mentioned kind of already that are playing um, in WhatsApp groups and things like that. So I'd always be chatting to them at, at how they're thinking they're going to do this season and, and what the kind of outlook is, is looking for them. So, yeah, it always, always keep up on it and hopefully someday they can pull off a county with all Donovan Rasa and if they do I'll be I'll be back for that celebration anyway, no matter what time of the year it is oh, Great stuff no absolutely pleasure to talk to you Liam thank you so much for, for chatting to us and filling us in on, on your adventure in, in the States hopefully we'll see, see you back in, in Skib before too long that things will settle down and you'll get to spend a bit of time back home as well but uh, until then thanks Liam and best of luck in the future Thanks Kieran. thanks for having me Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And before we wrap up, as always, we're going to do a quick preview of what's to come in this week's Southern Star Sports section. And Kieran, I know you've done a deep dive on one of Cork's top ladies footballers this week. So that's one I'm excited to read. What can you tell us about it at this stage? Yeah, it's a two-page feature on Kinsale and Cork footballer Orla Finn, who is a two-time All-Star, and she's one of the leading lights of, of Cork ladies football for the best part of a decade. So 
what I've done, I've charted Orla's career from, from from the very start, from her her debut in the Skeena School for Summer Cove National School back when she was a nine-year-old in third class to where she is now, like I said, one of the, the best, most le- lethal forwards in the game. And I've told her story by chatting to the people who've been around her from the very start, so from her national school teacher to Charlie McLaughlin, who coached her under 14 and under 16, to Ashling Judge, who's her Kinsale teammate and Ashley was telling me that she's played with Orla longer than any other footballer because they started together in secondary school and they've come up through the ranks together. I was talking to the Kinsale ladies manager, Michal O'Sullivan, about, Michal O'Connor, sorry, about her. Um, talked to Orla herself and caught up with her dad, Jor Finn, just to piece together this jigsaw that tells the story of a of a quite young girl, Jack, who back when she was 13 wanted to give up football. Um, she was, by her own account, she was very quiet, she was very shy. She was in the Cork under 14 panel, but um, she didn't want to go to training. She was just, like I said, a very shy person. But her parents, Jur and Eileen, were great rocks and great sources of encouragement. They told her, kept at it, keep at it. Charlie McLaughlin, who was her trainer, convinced her, or let stay at it, stay at it. She did, and she went on to win under 14 All Ireland's, under 16, under 21, six senior, um, an incredible forward, an incredible player. So it's um it's well worth to read in Thursday Southern Star. It's, it is the highlight of this week's sports section. And just tell us about the clip that you tweeted out earlier today where you sourced it and uh, maybe describe it for listeners. And just for listeners who are wondering what I'm talking about, head over to Kieran's Twitter account, which, what's your handle? Kieran Mac underscore SS, is it? That's the one, uh, at Kieran Mac underscore SS. So what this is, um, this is probably the first footage of Orla Finn in action. And like I mentioned earlier, um, about she started off playing football with Summer Cove National School in the Skeena Skull. So thanks to Kinsale GA Club and thanks to thanks to her teacher, Rose O'Regan from Summer Cove, um, I got my hands on this clip. So it's, it, it shows Orla coming on as a sub in the 2001 Skeena Skull Decider against Belenadi. Um, Orla was only nine years old at the time. She was in third class, but she 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 played without fear. They put her into the attack. You could see her getting on the ball straight away. She was shown for the ball. She showed that burst of speed that we know associate with her, and she got a super goal at the end that sealed a uh, sealed a three two. Um, just to do a uh, bit of analysis two. on the clip. She she looks head and shoulders above most of the other players on the field, and as you say, she was only in third class, and and most of the girls are two and three heads taller than her but she's getting out in front of her marker catching high balls coming in dropping the shoulder turning and she was in third class so like i'm not going to say i i i could tell that she was going to be brilliant because obviously i know the the context she did go on to be a two-time all-star as you say but looking at it there and knowing what she went on to achieve you can definitely see that bit of magic that she had just from that short one minute clip 100% 100% Jack and like she went from strength to strength after that I won't say too much because it's obviously in, in this week's Southern Star but from that super sub performance like what she's got on to become since is incredible and and it's how she carries herself as well anyone that knows or the Finn knows she um she she's that one for the limelight she doesn't want to kind of stand centre stage she's she's very much a team player she's a fantastic role model for any, any ladies footballer, um, whether it can say West Cork, right across the country. Um, she's a terrific ambassador too for West Cork and for, for Kinsale. And one of my favourite pieces of this feature is I caught up with Own Nation, who was an Evo Rangers footballer, Cork under 20. He was, I think he was a Cork minor as well. And a couple of years back, he had to mark Orla in a challenge game. And I'm not going to give away too much, but Own lets us in what it was like to, 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 to mark Orla Finn. And, um, it's a game he remembers, let's put it like that. So pick up Thursday Southern Star and sit back, relax and enjoy reading about one of one of the greats of Cork Ladies football. Like I said, two-time All-Star, six-time All-Ireland winner and just an all-round fantastic person and footballer. Lovely stuff, Kieran. And anything else you want to flag up in this week's sports section before we wrap up? Yeah, we have a nice interview with Sandra Dunahoo. She's from Ross Garbury. She's the 17-year-old who won the LGFA Young Volunteer uh, of the Year Award. And she was presented with that at a virtual ceremony last Friday evening. So Ger McCarthy has caught up with her. Also, we've caught up with five um, Carberry senior football managers from James McCarthy in Castlehaven, Declan Dwyer and Dawn. He's JJDC, who's manager of the Clannock Kilty Ladies, uh, Martin Bohan of O'Donovan Ross. Uh, and Declan Hayes of Carby Rangers, just to get their thoughts on what they think should happen with the GACs in the head. 
Um, should Intercounty still go first ahead of Clove? Should Clove actually be put ahead of Intercounty like last year? Um, we don't know what's going to happen right now. So we got the thoughts of five local football managers who fill us in what they think should happen. Lovely motorsport piece too. Martin Walsh has caught up with Sean Hurley from Clingariff to tell his motorsport and rallying story. So there's a, a great read in that. Just um, a shout out to Martin Walsh and his West motorsport Park pieces, Kieran. Sorry to cut across you. Martin Walsh has been doing some amazing work on the motorsport pages over the the last well for years and years but especially during the pandemic he hasn't uh he hasn't um rested on his laurels just just knocking out brilliant piece after brilliant piece so i'd urge anyone to make sure to even if you're not interested in motorsport which i wouldn't be at all but i still read martin's pieces every week because they're just brilliantly written really interesting and you learn so much about west cork and the history it has at rallying so i would just urge anyone who hasn't taken to reading Martin's motorsport pieces yet. Do do yourself a favour and uh, take a look. I 100% agree with you, Jack. I think what these the last 11 months have allowed people is to kind of to dip into their, their their box of ideas and Martin's one of the best in the business at that. He's he's knocked it out of the park every week. Um, well, since the motorsport column came online with the Southern Star all those years ago, but especially in the last 11 months, I feel, because he's telling the stories of so many characters and people involved in West Cork motorsport. And maybe in a normal run of things, if we were living in normal times, we wouldn't have the chance to delve into these stories and tell these people stories. But we do know, and they're, they're brilliant stuff. And this week again of Sean Hurley and Glyn Gareth, it's a brilliant, brilliant read. So I'd recommend that. So there's a lot in this week's Southern Star Sports section again, Jack. Brilliant stuff. And of course, it will be available to purchase in shops across West Cork and beyond from Thursday morning. And if you can't get to the shops, you can always subscribe online just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and you can subscribe to the southern star digital edition for less than two euro per week thanks for listening to the star sport podcast we'll be back at the same time next week if you enjoy these shows please make sure to rate review and subscribe on apple podcasts spotify youtube or wherever you get your podcasts slant hommel